Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory, the video course where we talk a lot about random variables. And in today's part 21, we will extend the notion of the expectation of a random variable. More precisely, we will talk about the so-called conditional expectation, where the condition is an event. In fact, we will also generalize that later, such that also random variables can be conditions. However, first let's start with the basic case. But before we go into the definitions, first I want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube, on Patreon or by other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter you have a lot of advantages, for example PDF versions and early access for all new videos. Ok, so this video today is about conditional expectation, so let's first recall the notion of conditional probability. There we had a very nice notation, we wrote P of A under B. Hence we have two events here, where B is called the condition. And if you remember, we had a very nice picture, so here we have the whole sample space omega and inside we find the subset B. And now the idea of the conditional probability is that we only want to calculate inside the set B. This means for the conditional probability P of A under B, only this intersection here is important for the calculation. Or in other words, the conditional probability asks about the ratio of this intersection here in relation to B. Therefore, what we get is a well-defined probability measure again. And to keep the notation simple, we just call it P dot under B. However, here please don't forget, this is only a probability measure if the probability of B is non-zero. This makes sense, because otherwise we will not be able to calculate ratios here. Ok, so that was just to refresh your memory, but you see, we have here a well-defined probability measure called the conditional probability. Therefore, it should also be possible to calculate expectations with respect to this new measure. And indeed, this is the whole idea of the conditional expectation. Therefore, I would say, if we look at examples, you will immediately understand what we do here. But before we do that, first we should write down the formal definition. So as always, we start with a probability space and now we take an event B from the sigma algebra A. And now you already know, the only condition we need here is that the probability of P is non-zero. Therefore, by the things we said before, we immediately get a new probability space as well. Namely, we can take the same ingredients and only change the probability measure. So you can always remember that, with the conditional probability, we always get an additional probability space. In fact, this is very important, because a random variable x will always live on both probability spaces. This makes sense, because by definition, the random variable only needs the sample space and the sigma algebra. Or in other words, changing the probability measure will not change the random variables. However, of course it will change the probabilities related to the random variable. For example, the expectation of a random variable really depends on the chosen measure. It's in the definition because it's given as the abstract integral of the random variable. And of course, the integral only makes sense with respect to the given probability measure. So this definition is not new at all, it's the ordinary expectation of a random variable. However, of course, here no one stops us when we change the probability measure in this integral. But still, of course, we assume that the integrals here exist. Ok, and then what we have here is the expectation of the random variable given in this new probability space. And therefore, as the conditional probability, it gets a new name. First, we write it as E of x under the condition B. And second, we simply say this is the conditional expectation of the random variable x given the event B. So you see, this is not a complicated definition, but it will be very important in explicit calculations. However, before we look at examples, let me show you how you can remember this formula easily. Or in other words, how we can also interpret this conditional expectation. In order to see this, let's write down the definition of the conditional probability here in the corner. So from above, we know this was given as the probability of A intersected B, 
divided by the probability of b. This means in this formula here, 1 divided by probability of b is just a scaling factor. The actual information for the probability of a under the condition b is given in this intersection. And now by using an abstract integral, we could say we integrate over the set a. And inside, the random variable we integrate is the indicator function of the set b. In fact, this abstract integral now gives us exactly the probability of a intersected b. Now, in the case that you have never seen this indicator function here, let me write down the definition of it. Of course, as a random variable, it gets inputs from the sample space, so we put in lowercase omegas. And now the output is 1 or 0, depending if omega lies in b or not in b. So you see, this is a really simple function, and it lets us rewrite the conditional probability. And that's something we can now use for the conditional expectation. Namely, since we integrate here with respect to the conditional probability measure, we can substitute that by this formulation here. This means the scaling factor we can pull in front, and then we just have an integral with respect to the original measure p. And inside, we now find the random variable x and the random variable given by the indicator function. And we always write the indicator function with this bold 1, because it reminds you that the only values are 1 and 0. Therefore, what you see in the end, what we get out, is an ordinary expectation, but for a product of two random variables. In other words, we can write scaling factor times expectation of x times 1 of b. And of course, we can also exchange the order here, so we can write indicator function times x. So that's definitely something you should remember for calculations, because it means you don't have to change the measure in your calculation, just use the original one, but change the function inside. Okay, and how this works, we can immediately see in an example. And I would say, let's first discuss a continuous case. Namely, the random variable x should be normally distributed. This means the distribution of x should be given by the normal distribution, where we choose the expectation as 0 and the variance as 1. Or more precisely, we would write that we choose the standard deviation as 1. Indeed, this is something we have discussed in part 17. Moreover, there we have learned that the probability density function is given by an exponential function. And for our chosen parameters here, we get that. In fact, you should know the density function is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And for this reason, let's choose our condition b in an asymmetrical way. Namely, b should be given as the subset in omega where x of omega is greater than 0. And you already know, this is the short notation we use for that. In particular, this means here for our density function, only the parts right from the y-axis play a role. Okay, then let's calculate the conditional expectation by using our formula from before. This means we have to use our normal translation to go from the abstract integral to our ordinary one-dimensional integral there. In other words, this is the so-called change of variables formula. So either you already know how it works, or you introduce a lowercase omega to actually do it. Indeed, the whole formula simply means that x of omega goes to lowercase x. And then we simply substitute everything and get an integral in r. And then we have lowercase x times the indicator function of the pre-image of capital X. And then comes simply the density function times dx. Okay, so this is our integral and it looks more complicated than it really is because this indicator function here is very simple. In fact, we already know the only possible values are 1 and 0. And moreover, we exactly see that we have 1 if x is greater than 0. Simply because this is exactly how we have defined our set B. Therefore, for this reason, we could have substituted that from the beginning, but I wanted to show you how the whole change of variables formula works. Therefore, no matter how we do it, we get this nice short formula where only the integral limits changed. Of course, this is what you should see. The indicator function just changes the domain of integration. 
Okay, now before we solve this integral, let's first talk about the scaling factor. Now the probability of b is given by integrating the density function from 0 to infinity. And by symmetry, we already know this has to be 1 half. So in other words, 1 divided by the probability has the factor 2. Okay, and now by putting in the density function, we see what we have to integrate. So it's x times the exponential function dx. And now since x is in front, we have a very nice antiderivative for this function inside the integral. Namely, it's minus the exponential function of minus x squared divided by 2. Indeed, this is easy to see, just calculate the derivative of this function. And now by putting in the boundaries of the integral, we see what comes out here is exactly 1. In conclusion, 2 divided by the square root of 2 pi is exactly our conditional expectation. Therefore, we see, in contrast to the ordinary expectation, it's not 0. However, of course here we expected a positive number, because we only worked in the positive numbers anyway. Okay, with that we have seen one example of a conditional expectation in a continuous case. However, now before we go to a discrete example, let me first show you a very general example. In other words, this is an abstract example. So here you see, I want the conditional expectation of a random variable given by the indicator function of a set A. Therefore, by our original definition, we can use the conditional probability measure here. However, at this point we have already learned that the indicator function just changes the domain of definition. In other words, we can rewrite that as an abstract integral where we integrate over the set A and inside we just have the constant function 1. However, this simply means that we have to multiply this constant function by the measure of the domain of integration. So we conclude that we just have to put A into our conditional probability measure. Therefore, we get out our original conditional probability. So this means the conditional probability can be rewritten as a conditional expectation. So please keep that in mind whenever you see conditional expectations of indicator functions. Okay, and now as promised, the last example of today will be a discrete one. And there, let's keep it simple, let's say we throw one die. And now x just counts the outcome, so how many i's do we see? And now the condition b should be that we either throw a 5 or a 6. So this is what we do, we restrict ourselves to the highest numbers. And now my question is, what is our expectation of x under this condition? And in order to practice what is happening here, let us first write down the abstract integral again. So now we know we can write it as the integral over b of the random variable x. Indeed, we have learned that the indicator function of b can be put into the domain of integration. In other words, you also can remember this formula for the conditional expectation. However, for our example here, we have to translate that into the discrete case. This means the integral symbol now becomes a sum, and inside we have a lowercase x times the probability mass function. And if we don't want to give it a name, we can simply write p of capital X is equal to lowercase x. However, here, because of the definition of b, we already know that we only sum two values. Namely, x is equal to 5 and 6. So you see, now we are ready to put in numbers. Now first, of course, the probability of b is exactly 2 over 6. And then we have the sum with two entries. So first we have 5 times 1 over 6 plus 6 times 1 over 6. So we see we have 11 over 6 divided by 2 over 6. So let's cancel the 6 and let's write 11 divided by 2, which we can also express as 5.5. So not a surprise, this is the expectation we have for throwing one die under the condition that 5 or 6 should be the outcome. So there you see the explicit meaning of the conditional expectation. Okay, I think that's good enough for this video. Let's generalize this notion in the next videos. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.